The Count of Monte Cristo is of course one of the most gripping novels ever written, and on the other hand, one of the most badly written novels of all time and of all literatures. I'm Head of the Curve, also known as James Bergman, and in today's book review I am discussing The Count of Monte Cristo, first published in 1846, written by Alexandre Dumas. As I read out at the beginning of this video, that's actually from the introduction from my copy of the book. And it's funny because I only read the introduction as I usually do when it comes to classics or books that I haven't read yet, uh, because they can often be quite spoiler heavy and they don't sometimes tell you that, which is kind of fr frustrating. But even the introduction, one of the first things that they say is that the book is badly written, but at the same time, one of the greatest novels ever written. And, you know, when I was reading this uh, over a thousand page book, which has taken me uh, a couple weeks, three weeks to read, I was thinking, yeah, there are quite a lot of repetitive phrases, there are uh, quite a lot of the same words being used, and the writing, and, and I'm not the only one to say this, I, I believe, uh, not that I've really gone into how the public have perceived the book other, other than it being good, I think it's probably fair to say that Dumas was milking the story, because at the time when he was writing the book it was actually serialised, so over a span of years, I believe, uh, I think so, he was writing this book and eventually it came to be this length, over a thousand pages is my particular copy and more for normal editions since this is a hardback, a bigger, bigger print, which I prefer for longer books in general. So what do I want to say about this book? Well, a few things. The first 300 pages of The Count of Monte Cristo is some of the best literature I've ever read, right? Some of the best literature I've ever read. It, it, it really is. The premise of this book is phenomenal. And for those who are uh, unaware of the premise, on the day of his wedding, Edmund Dante, Master Marina, is arrested on Marseilles on trumped up charges and spirited away to the cellars of the Chateau d'Uff. I don't know how you say that, by the way, uh, that, that's French. Uh, <laughs> my French isn't great. An impregnable sea fortress in which he is imprisoned indefinitely. Escaping from the Chateau by a series of daring manoeuvres, he unearths a great treasure on the island of Monte Cristo, buried there by a former fellow prisoner who bequeaths him the secret of its whereabouts. Thus armed with unimaginable wealth and embittered by his long imprisonment, he resolves to devote his life to tracking down and punishing those responsible. Now, tell me, please, is that not a great, is that not a great uh, premise for a book? It, it is absolutely fantastic. The first 300 pages are phenomenal. Really, really good. It's only when it gets past that for the next, what, 500 to 600 pages, we are introduced to I think 15 different characters, if not more, including side characters. We are introduced to a whole uh, load of new information. Information which, as far as I'm concerned, I felt was unnecessary. It was quite clear to me that Dumas was more interested in money, perhaps, than actually writing a succinct novel. Right? I, I genuinely feel he could have ended the book without it exceeding perhaps 500 pages, may, maybe 600 if I'm being sympathetic. This book did not need to be as long as it is. To be honest with you, it was a struggle at times to read this book because of how long it is and also because of how unnecessary I felt a lot of the, the, the characters were, uh, the writing was. Now I'm not saying that the characters are bad, it's more to say that I prefer the original characters that are actually in the first 300 pages. Uh, you know, the three individuals who uh, betray, who betray um, uh, uh, the Count of Monte Cristo or, or Edmund Dante or, or whatever version you, you'd like. Uh, and I'm interested in his relationship with Mercedes and, and uh, you know, and, and how he exacts revenge, right? What he does after his imprisonment. And whilst we get that to an extent, what we 
get before the revenge is something that really turned me off and I felt was, again, completely unnecessary. We learn of all the lives of, of people's grandchildren and children, and I'm just not interested in that. I, I don't care. Frankly, I don't really care about the characters that were introduced. I, I found them to not be bad characters, I just found they were unnecessary for the plot. Because the plot, as as far as I'm concerned, was, and the most attractive part of the book was, okay, what is Edmund Dante is going to do once he escapes prison, and how does he plot his revenge? And yes, it is very satisfying towards the ending, but I have to read, like, what, 600 pages of, I'm not going to be so harsh to call it filler, but it feels like that at times. I do feel, and I don't say this very often, but... I only say this for Dostoevsky and, and now this book. An edition that is uh, cut down, uh, that is abridged, I do feel like that's probably worth reading more than the full one because it, it just feels unnecessary. The Because remember as well, of course, because it was serialised at the time, they weren't thinking, oh, it was really long. They were thinking, oh, great, you know, uh, next week or next month we have a new entry of this of this story. This is great. So at the time of it being released, I'm sure it was amazing, and, and nobody really had any complaints. Because why would you if if it was serialized and it wasn't it wasn't so long? Um, but it's only when you read it in its full bulk that you really realize how uh, how he really milked it. Now maybe I'm being too harsh. Uh, now, despite what the introduction says, I, I don't think the writing is awful, right? I think the writing is good, but to me, it's it's the fact that. Dumas had to had had to create so many different characters and so many different you know plot lines that I didn't care to read, right? I, I just really didn't. In the last I don't know two hundred pages, three hundred pages, uh, maybe two hundred. That's where the meat is. That's where all the revenge is. That's where what we want to see. But what's in between is completely unnecessary. I mean, it's good for somebody if, you know, you're stuck on a desert island or something and you, and you need a long book to read. But even if I was doing that, I, I'd still I'd still come back with the same review. Hey, it's 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 a bit unnecessary, the, the amount of plot lines and the amount of characters plunged in for the sake of money, essentially. And I think that is an accusation that some people might deny about Dumas. Uh, I don't mean to say it in a malicious way, but uh, just from a more a humorous sense. He was clearly aware that his book was received well, the first 300 pages, or at least, you know, the first half, and he played on that. And fair enough to him. But for the sake of literary value and literary integrity, mm, yeah, I don't need to read like 600 pages, uh, or 500 pages about, you know, grandchildren, children. I, I don't care. I don't care. So yeah, uh, this this seems like an overly negative review. I mean, I did I did enjoy the book. I think that this book is, whilst I would say, on one hand, it feels like it would be hard to reread because of how long it is, but in the other regard, I feel like it would be a good uh, book to reread for the sake of there are so many different characters, so many different details to pick up on. I'm sure I didn't pick up on everything. Uh, probably most things I didn't pick up on because I. It was just so much. It, it was just so much, and uh, yeah, it. it I, I was. I found it difficult to concentrate at times because of that. So on one hand, it does feel very readable, and I'm sure I will revisit it once again. But on the other, it does feel like a very tedious exercise. And by the end, I was kind of glad it was over, even though you know I I, I did enjoy the ending. I thought that it was really really well written towards the end, and and it was perfectly and succinctly. Um, you know, encapsulated and and, uh, and ended. Moving on to the more philosophical themes of the book. Now, it's not really a philosophical book, um, although in the prison sequences, you know, when Dante is 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 in prison and he's going mad and he's delirious, when he meets the other prisoner as well who helps him, that was the first segment of the story, and and I love that. And there are philosophical themes there that, you know, there's psychology, there, there's, there's, as I said, philosophy in the sense that, you know, what happens to a man, what, what psychologically happens when he's falsely accused and what, what goes through a man's mind and how does he deal with that? I mean, madness, right? Deliriousness. Uh, at one point he tried to starve himself because he was, uh, because he was waiting for so long 
for somebody to come and say, "Look, you've been falsely accused. Uh, we're sorry. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll uh, reacquit you and so on." The main point of the book, I think, on a philosophical level, is that whilst revenge might taste sweet, it always has its repercussions. And I'm not going to go into the book deeply here. I just wanted to give my thoughts. But it's quite clear that throughout the the end of the piece, characters are, you know, Dante doesn't uh, appreciate other characters, to put it lightly, and another character might not want them to die or to be harmed, even though Dante's revenge includes them to be in the puzzle as well. So the idea is that whilst we might seek vengeance for what is done to us, we should always remember, or at least uh, take into account that a domino effect always happens, right? That there's always a butterfly effect, a domino effect of things that you might feel are worth doing in terms of getting a revenge in, in, in the book of Monte Cristo. But what occurs, of course, is that that person, that individual has friends, relatives, and whilst your revenge might extend only to them, and you would even admit that, inevitably it also extends to the people who knew them as well. So the quest for revenge, Dante is, he, he, he grew up slightly towards the end because Mercedes is talking to him about it and about her child. It's quite clear that he does learn. There is a, there is a learning curve there. And he does, he does understand to an extent that, that vengeance isn't necessarily a, a good thing. Like punishing bad people, bad people, and punishing good people. It's not, it's not that simple. And that's kind of what the book also betrays. It, it's, it's, it's what is good and bad isn't self-evident, right? And even if somebody can be charged of a crime or, or of uh, immor immorality, let's say, if, if they do betray you, if, if you do want to exact revenge on them, vengeance, there are repercussions that extend far, far uh, more than, than you would think initially. As well as, of course, Dante's being uh, be, being falsely accused of being a traitor. The catalyst of that, of course, is his father uh, becoming grief and, and, and then starving to death. Mercedes living in an unhappy uh, marriage and, and all sorts of things happen. And so the whole book is one huge domino effect of what happens to somebody if they're falsely accused, not only to them, but actually to the people around them, and how does it affect the mind and also uh, the world around them? And of course, what happens to those who accused him falsely? How, does their li how do their lives go? Because quite clearly throughout the piece, their lives didn't go too well on a psychological level, but they did on a uh, material level. I mean, a couple of them became very rich, good positions. Um, and sometimes it doesn't come back on them, and that's the thing. God is a very big uh, axiom within the piece. All of them assume God's existence, and in turn, they call upon him when they're in disbelief of their situation. And Dante does have faith in God, even, even towards the end, because whilst he didn't imprison, he was given the hope and the light. So God is a very prevalent, religion is a very prevalent thing in the piece. And I found that very interesting. Would I recommend the book? I would probably recommend it if you don't mind long pieces of literature. I'd recommend it if you want to read you know, the classics, the, the things that the pieces of literature that have influenced narratives, uh, archetypes, stories in the future to now and, and beyond. Um, but if you don't have time for a book that has loads of filler and I, I know this is debatable because of course many people like all the detail of the grandchildren and what, what they think and what they're doing and, and all things like that but I prefer a plot that is succinct and does its job and it, it doesn't overcompensate right and unfortunately in this piece there is just a lot of filler in my opinion um I, I just too much to me just too much for me to bear it was a relief to finish the book even though I did enjoy it overall uh, but yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd recommend it in that regard, but if you're like me and you prefer short, uh, succinct 
you, if you like, narratives that are very self-contained and there's not this whole spiral of like kids and, and loads of other people, like 20 characters like in Dostoevsky novels, which I don't mind in Dostoevsky's books, but as you guys know, um, I have been critical of them as well in, in places. Uh, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you did and subscribe if you're new and you want more videos on philosophy, literature. Thank you for watching and I, as I said I'm glad that I finished this book because uh, it has taken me a while, <laughs> very strenuous, but it was worth reading. It was worth reading. Anyway, have a good day. I'll see you soon.